Welcome back to your next episode, the podcast aimed at people bursting into their 40s, 50s and beyond with Amy Cooper and me, Louise Daniels. And we're back after our summer break and we're very excited to be back in the studio together for the first time since March, aren't we, Amy? Oh, we really are. It's so nice to actually see you. I've just been, like, listening to you. (laughs) And we had a few, like, it took us a while, didn't it, to get used to recording in different locations yeah. so three different locations us and a guest and you know we kept talking over each other and you know um... absolutely and I think as we were saying weren't we before this whole lockdown thing the whole online recording seemed to be like a, a second best mm. and then it and then it transformed into being well the only option yeah. uh, and it actually kept me sane so thank you so for anyone new to the podcast the premise is midlife interests which um you know basically i think just actually just gives us a free reign to discuss anything that's of interest to us because we're in that age group would you say that's a fair assumption yeah and i think also it's sort of like it's funny because when i sort of describe to people this podcast i say especially the young comedians that I mean, I I say, oh, well, it probably wouldn't have been of interest to you because it's just about old life issues. And actually it's like, oh, no, no, come on, Amy, let's rebrand midlife. That's what we've been doing. And actually I still feel like I'm fucking 20 years old. But you are, hang on, let's, you are much younger than me anyway. Well, we bookend, we bookend midlife. (laughs) I'm, I'm, I was 43 last week. I was 51 last week. So, well, well, on Monday I was 51. Yeah, bank holiday Monday. So what Um, you got, people, is... (laughs) A double Virgo situation. absolutely. (laughs) And I discovered I share my birthday with Dolly Alderton and Kirsty Allsop as well. Oh, well, well, come on. We're in the best of company, aren't we? Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Um, So uh, it's back to school time and I'd just like to take a moment to acknowledge what a massive deal this this year's back to school is for you, Amy, and for many, many parents. How old are you? Because how old are your children? So I've got a a five-year-old and a nine-year-old and and they skipped back uh, yesterday. Okay. And yeah, it's sort of like, you know, like the men that came back from the war, (laughs) you know, like, like, and and, and the relationships weren't quite the same. And and like, (laughs) you know, I've just got, I've got a slight mild PTSD and and I was in the park this morning and I've forgotten just how to do sort of like, hi, how are you? I go straight to, uh, I'm not really very, I'm not, you know, like that, that nicety and and the the social, the, the, the wheels that were oiled by social graces. Mm. I've, it's a muscle that I've not worked yeah. for a while. So yeah, I, I'm I'm okay, but I'm a bit manic, and then I'll just weep, and yeah. I, it's just what what it's it is what it is. But you know the homeschooling. What you know, I mean that was, I I mean I, I well how how was it? It was not obviously that's not something you ever signed up for, is it? I mean when no. you when you decided to have children, uh, you know if if someone that was never on the agenda. Do you know what I, I have those times where I'm kind of like. You know, in the grand scheme of things, like I'm, you know, I'm lucky. Mm. We've got a garden. I, I'm, it, I, I've got children who are sort of vaguely up for listening to vaguely sort of thirty percent of what I was saying. So <laughs> looking back, maybe it's a bit like childbirth when you're actually in it and you're crowning and you're just like, I'm gonna die. I mean, the number of times I weeped into the washing machine, but you were the same because you hadn't seen your grown up children. No, I know. So it yeah. was a thing that, um, a bit like Madonna said in her rose petal laden bath. Oh, do you remember? Yes, I do, yes. Um, like, we're all in this boat together, people. <laughs> like, it was, yeah, it, no matter what your circumstance, it's all relative. We just went through that shit. Yeah. And, and who knows if. Is that going to happen again? I don't know. I mean, yeah. Did you see my little sketch that I did of the woman who's on a date night with her husband? Oh, I did. (laughs) And she's just like, what if they don't go back in September? (laughs) And thankfully, they've gone back. So, yeah, I'm, I'm... Cock a hoop. And how are you feeling now? You're you're absolutely fine about them going back. You're not like weeping and missing them, and you know, no, no, good, no. no. I mean, yeah, I'd have been disappointed in you if you yeah. said that you were. But I'm no like, shame I mean, to no, anybody no. who, yeah, absolutely. We all feel differently. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But, yeah. Like, <laughs> like you know, if you're sitting there going, oh, but I was weeping, then you're a dickhead. Like, like, <laughs> get your life, get your shit together, get your life together. I think we had that little snippet of that time with our angels, mm. and you can cherry pick those memories and think about all the times that they were really sweet and their little smiles lit up the day. I saw that somebody put on Facebook, oh, it's been a really difficult four months, but your smile lit up those darkest... I thought, oh, fuck oh, off. God, yes. Like, like I, you know, no, I, I just wanted to bang their heads together on a regular basis. But um, no. th- they're back now. They needed it. We yeah, needed it. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, even even the powers that be recognised mm, that. Mm, so. Absolutely. And I, can't, I cannot put into words my genuine respect and admiration for all the parents with children Children who you were of that age where they needed support yeah. for with homeschool homeschooling. Um, 
because my I've got three that have left home. My youngest is fifteen. He didn't need any help at all. It was great. He just cracked on with it. Um, but you know, and also all the teachers that you know made that happen as yeah. well. Because I, you know, I know that there must have been a lot of work you know going on for them. I do um, hope that that is the thing of sort of resetting sort of teachers healthcare workers like resetting the, the like the massive respect and and like and we need that we need those people it's not like a you know oh, uh, a wax lyrical on my instagram stories about the conversations that i'm having with my grandmother who's 84 <laughs> and she's like well it, uh, if you want to be a nurse or you want to be a teacher it's a vocation you shouldn't get paid the same as someone who works in the city and I'm just like oh but that's a whole other podcast yeah. about um, you know like like <laughs> dealing with the octogenarians yeah, yeah. Um, of course yeah, yeah. Um, but anyway here we are uh, yes. you know, beginning of September back to school and I always get that sort of uh, fresh start feeling at the beginning of sem- September and I think it's just ingrained from years and years and years of that annual you know, back to school thing oh, yeah. my, oh look what I'm doing Oh, do you know what? My she's just, just come she's uh, buttons come down. She's flashing me a beautiful, beautiful <laughs> bra. Um, so yeah, I mean, we could get. So this is a sponsorship angle, I think. You know, fig leaves. God, we're not um, vision there. Um, so uh, yeah. So I always get that sort of fresh start uh, thing at the beginning of September yeah. um, and it's a time of sort of potential and, and, and hope and it's a time when I think, oh, I'm going to do all the things that I thought that I tried to do in January, you know, like yeah. people have New Year's resolutions, but I feel even more up for it, you know, um, in September. But this September in particular, because I have to say I'm, you know, bitterly disappointed in my um, post-lockdown self. Um, and I know we're all supposed to be body positive and all of that stuff. And, you know, but I'm, I'm not. Uh, you know, when, when, when lockdown was announced, I actually thought to myself, right, I'm going to... Um, I'm going to emerge from this like a butterfly. I just thought I'm going to use this time, not just physically, I was going to get physically fit and I was going to, you know, eat more healthily and all of that sort of thing. But also I thought I'm going to read more. I'm going to be a bit more informed because I'm someone I've always got an opinion and it's not always like the most... um, informed opinion um, and I just thought oh I'll be a totally different person at the at the end of it but I actually spent most of lockdown sort of well grazing in my kitchen you know so just sort of constantly eating I don't think I've even let myself get peckish in the last five months <laughs> grazing staring into space um, and achieving very little really you know I mean I've, I've the only thing I've achieved is a gunt if I'm honest but you know <laughs> so you know um that's yeah. that's been a labour of love that yeah, event. It really please. has. Yeah. Um, I would I would hazard a guess that you've probably read three to four novels no. on Twitter. Oh yes, like like we, all the collective <laughs> shit that you've consumed and put out yeah, on yeah. Twitter. I, I reckon that you've. Um, I did up my Twitter game at one point, but that's a oh god, it's a vicious place to go. Yeah. Jesus Christ, I mean, it's you not know. the nice calm waters of Instagram, Ooh, it's not is the it? Nice calm waters of Instagram. No, no, it's no. But, shark you know, infested. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but we did keep the podcast going didn't yeah. we so you know we did that up until right through to end of July I think it was um, and with some excellent guests so if you haven't um, listened before I do urge you to go back and have a listen uh, to some of some of those um, yeah. you know anyone anyone that's new to the podcast so the guests that we've got on today um, I interviewed her yeah, at this... the beginning of August because well you were supposed to join me via um, you know, whatever it is, the internet. <laughs> yes. So this is this is this is sort of triggering because this is the time that I went to France and I had the receptionist of the hotel in a headlock saying, "Please make the internet work." You know, <laughs> this podcast is the only thing that is sort of like keeping me going. Anyway, uh, it didn't happen. So yeah, I, I wasn't involved in it, but it, yeah, but we it had was, a great chat. It was great. So it was with Aniki Somerville. Um, and if you don't follow her on Instagram, um, you absolutely must. She does like the best Instagram stories I think she's got a particular style uh, you need to just go on and have a look yeah. um, I I love them she's one of those you know when you just go oh great she's put something new up on her stories and I will take the time to sit back and, and, and look at those um so she, um, her novel Motherwhelmed fictionalised her own experience of balancing uh, parenthood with work and life. Mm-hmm. Um, and she also co-authored um, More Orgasms, Please, uh, Why Female Pleasure Matters, which was born out of the podcast that she co-founded uh, called The Hotbed Collective yes. podcast, which I think is coming back. Yeah. Um, uh, and, you know, which feels like it's a bit like a sort of um, um, a middle-aged or very grown-up sort of sex education podcast yeah um and 
she's now 47 um, and has two small children and she started a new podcast called How to Be a Boss at Ageing um, and she's also writing a book um, about midlife which isn't out yet but uh, so I, I don't know a, a title for that but her podcast she's got great guests on her podcast she's you know, really worth um, seeking mm. that out uh, as well so that's Niki Somerville coming up in just a moment that was a really good introduction there. It made me feel, I think sometimes we all have kind of off days where we think, oh, you know, I'm not really doing very well. And, and it's quite nice yeah. sometimes to just have somebody lining up the positive things that you've managed to all do. All the stuff that you've achieved. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So can you tell us about the new podcast and the book? Uh, but you, I, I don't know the title of the book yet. You haven't, you haven't finished it well no I mean basically what happened was I sort of found that while I was working on the hotbed uh, podcast and and certainly after writing the the novel which was I mean it was loosely based on my own experiences but it was fiction Mm. I sort of thought Mm. you know what I feel like I've got a lot to sort of contribute in terms of thinking about growing older you know it's just something that I'm always Mm. thinking about and I had lots of experiences such as I mean I became a mum when I was 40 and then I had my second daughter when I was 46 Um, Mm. And so I was also a kind of older mother and I was kind of I looked out and I sort of thought, actually, I I don't know if there's a lot of content that's really speaking to me. So, I mean, it's interesting at the moment. There's quite a lot of um, stuff around menopause, which is coming out, which is Mm. which is great. I'm not quite there at the menopause yet, you know, so. No. um, And equally, uh, the other thing I sort of noticed was there seemed to be a lot of kind of much older kind of women who are being profiled so you know if you look on the cover Mm. of I don't know maybe good housekeeping or something you might see um, I mean Dame Judi Dench is the typical example you know Helen Mirren um, you know even people like Oprah who are are absolutely wonderful Um, but again I'm not quite in my 70s yet either Um, and and then when I read magazine profiles of celebrities who were you know female celebrities who were kind of in their 40s and early 50s I felt that there was always this same sort of discourse coming out, which was essentially, you know, I'm really happy about being older. You know, I feel much more confident. You know, I I know who I am. And there was a lot, real positive story there, which, you know, a part of me was like, well, that's quite nice. But then there was nothing really spoken about in terms of the, I suppose, just the underlying challenges, um, which mm. are quite significant, really. And I, I think in particular, what, what inspired me was this kind of idea that, we keep having our foot on the accelerator. And actually, even when we're in our 40s and into our 50s, um, there's not kind of a role in terms of, or a path in terms of how do we age? And and in some ways people would say, oh, that's good. Mm -hmm. That's really liberating. But I also felt a sense like I needed to have a bit of perspective and to slow down a bit because essentially I was just feeling tired and overwhelmed all the time. Um, yeah. And I was sort of thinking, actually, why is this? And I was thinking, because you're 47. And so you can't yes. carry on in the same way that you did when you were 27. Um, and actually, people don't seem to be talking so much about the sort of overwhelm that can happen when you get into your 40s, when you've got perhaps a combination of not don't know what I'm doing with my career, don't feel that relevant, maybe have young children or you've got teenagers. Um, I'm I'm looking at everything and I'm thinking, is this the way I want to live my life? You know. Do I want to sort of live in the in the city anymore? Do I want to um, commute every day into London? You know, and you're also mm. keenly aware that actually this is oh, sounds really solemn. It's not the last chapter of your life, but it is um, certainly you're thinking yeah. this. If I haven't got it sus by now, then basically I'm a bit, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. You know, I'm still waiting to sort of get to that stage where I've just sort of advanced to. I just think at some point, yeah, you know, I'm fifty. Well, I'm fifty-one next month, in mm. fact. Um, and I keep thinking I'll get to a point where I'm sort of a calm, wise woman who has sort of progressed out of her fears and anxieties. But I just, I can't see it ever happening. And I'm still, yeah, still sort of floundering around, going, oh, what do I want to do? What you know, like time's running out, really. But I know. <laughs> well, it's interesting. It's part of um, the sort of research into the, the book that I was, you know, I haven't finished it yet, so I'm still sort of working on it at the moment. Um, mm. I spoke to Sally Hughes, who's she's quite a, a well-known beauty journalist yeah. and, and writes for the Guardian and. She was sort of saying, you know, and it's true that our definitions of ageing have kind of shifted. And she said, you know, nowadays, I mean, if you think back to maybe our grandmother's generation, by the time you were 50, you you probably had a purple rinse and you were wearing a cardigan. And, you know, there was a certain expectation that life slowed down. 
Um, mm. And maybe that wasn't very fulfilling because there was probably lots of women going, you know, I'm quite frustrated um, about this. But then again, there wasn't the expectation that you just had to keep on going and producing mm. and achieving. Um, so there has to be a bit of a balance. And I think sometimes we're in this transitional phase now where feminism has told us that essentially we can do whatever we want. We can have everything. We can achieve everything. And I think some women are sort of, and this isn't feminism to blame because it's, you know, it's amazing, but it's also given us this sense of, hang on a minute, I don't think I can, I don't think I can do it all. Mm. Um, and actually, maybe I need to just rethink a little bit and prioritise because I'm not sure that this is the route to happiness. Yeah, yeah. And and uh, do, you, do you find... I mean, certainly I do. I think I look at like paths that other people are taking, and then and then think, oh, I should be doing that. I, that's what, yeah. So that is, yeah, a real sort of pressure. So, like you say, yeah, just pausing and thinking. Actually, I can, I can do it my own way and slow down a bit. And, yeah, I know, mean, I think so. one of the most misleading things, and that's certainly about in, Instagram and social media, mm. is that. I sort of discovered, I, I sort of on the, move on the periphery of the influencer world. So, you know, I know quite a lot of influencers mm. and I, I used to go to a lot of events. I used to work with um, Molly Gunn, who, who runs Selfish yep. Mother and yep. edited that site. And I kind of, I'd meet these women and I think, my goodness, you know, they have got, you know, everything. They, they're doing a business. They've got young children. They've got this seemingly enormous house, you know, and what, what is actually going on? And what was interesting was that um, you're not always aware of what's going on behind the scenes. So, like, for example, yeah. um, I would go up to them and I'd say, you know, you're, you're bloody firing on all cylinders. I mean, you're just on fire. Like, everything you touch is so successful. And it yeah. would re it, often what I would discover was that, A, they weren't doing as well as I thought they were. Like, they weren't actually earning very much money. They were, they were yeah. struggling. They were perhaps having to hold down a day job. Um, as well so a kind of nine to five and so I was only seeing one facet that they were showing yeah. on Instagram um, the other side of it was actually or they were funded by an inheritance or a wealthy husband uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, yeah. and there was a financial side of it which I kind of feel we don't talk about very much no um, no when we look at successful women um, we often just, you know, we just assume that they've built it all themselves and often they have but what we don't see is perhaps um, well they're allowed to do that because of their financial circumstances and yeah of course. i think um there's, there's just a lot of pressure that we apply without knowing the full story yeah and there's that real ec epidemic of comparison on social media isn't it and, and i think and it affects all of us we're sort of you know like you say look but that's so that's interesting to to sort of think that actually yeah that those people are what we what we see so all of your instagram content is so relatable uh you know for i would say women from 30 to 50 because you've got um the baby and small children highs and lows alongside the awareness of entering midlife and the complications that come with that and and your that relatability um is very reassuring i i just find your yeah, your Instagram feed, your stories. I love your stories, which are their own sort of unique style, aren't they? Um, do, but do you find Instagram reassuring and mainly a positive thing, or does it make you? Well, it's interesting actually because um, this. I think we've. I've actually got a podcast coming out soon where I talk to a, a psychotherapist, Dr. Hilda Burke. Mm. Oh, sorry, she's not a doctor; it's just Hilda Burke. Um, but she talks about kind of our, our addiction to kind of social media and, and things, and. I I don't think my relationship with Instagram is very healthy, um, and <laughs> and I kind I kind of know that actually I have two. One side of me knows that um, I have to be mindful of when I look at it, and and for me mm. actually, um, because I'm a writer um, at the moment, what I'm quite sensitive to is if I see that other writers are getting book deals um, and celebrating mm. the success of their books. And I'll be completely, and I think everyone has a different pressure point in terms of what they're trying to achieve. And there'll be a little voice inside of me going, that's brilliant. You know, I'm really happy for her. It's excellent news that she's got this book deal. And, and that's amazing that it's a number one in the Sunday Times bestseller list. And, you know, and I'll be doing thumbs up emojis and, you know, this is great mm. and brilliant. And then there's a little voice inside that's saying, well, but you're a complete failure, aren't you, really? Oh. Because, you know, you're not a Sunday Times bestseller. And, and, and yeah. there's, I think women, mm. I mean, unfortunately, we're kind of conditioned to be quite competitive with one another from an early age and I think mm. we have this kind of idea that 
there's only a limited amount of success to go around for women so that when you see someone succeeding instead of sort of thinking actually that's a good thing because that means there's opportunities for everyone you sort of sometimes you can be conditioned to think oh well that's it then you know that's already all sewn up because they've written a book about that particular thing and and there's no point in me doing it. Um, no point. Yeah, that's it. I quite often feel like, oh, anything that I, you know, I, I, I would just think, oh, what is the what is the point in me doing anything? I mean, I've, I, you know, I haven't even got the bloody swipe up facility yet on Instagram. Mm. So really, what is the point? You know. No, and then it's and, and so actually, it's it's. A, I mean, on the one hand, I've met really brilliant people on Instagram, and I've used it as a networking tool, and that's the positive side. Mm. Um, and then on the negative side, I feel if I'm having a bad day and I look at it, it just confirms my own sense of failure, you know. And, and then actually, I think those are the days where you really need to try and stay away from it. Stay away from it, maybe. Mm. Yeah. Apart from like your, but you, then when you're when you're having a bad day, you you as I say, your stories are in a, in a certain style. I don't know what I don't know how to de- how to describe it. People just have to go and, and find and watch. Um, but I find that really reassuring, and I'll, you know, because it, it it is so honest. You're brutally honest in your Instagram stories, and so you know. And I know that you know, like for example, that the last four months has been really really gruelling for you, hasn't it? Has it? yeah. And I think actually oh. that's an interesting. Um, the way that I sort of deal, I suppose, with life generally is um, telling stories. And so whether that is actually mm. writing stories or whether it's creating silly stories through animations or little videos and things, that's that's kind of how I put things into perspective. And so actually, even if I am going through a difficult time, because, um, yeah, I mean, everyone's been in lockdown. And then the complicating factor mm. with me is that I also lost my father right at the beginning yeah. of lockdown. Yeah. Um, it was a, it wasn't Corona related, but that those kind of factors um, at the time, I, I don't know, some people would just say, oh, you're oversharing. But actually, when I did no. talk about my father and losing my father, I found that suddenly there was a tidal wave of women who were getting in touch with me. And I found it very supportive because actually I didn't know anyone else in terms of friends um, who had lost. Well, actually, I did. I had one friend who had lost a father and, and she she I, I just sort of feel that actually using a losing a parent is quite a significant loss. And I needed mm. I needed to hear stories from other women who had gone through the same thing. And and yeah. actually Instagram in that moment was very supportive. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, because you had, yeah, like you say, lockdown and small children um, at home, you know, worries about work, financial stuff and, and, and your and your dad dying as mm. well. So, you know, um, a really difficult, a difficult few months in particular, I think, for you. So, yeah, and uh, I think, yeah. I mean, what's interesting is that my dad was a really big um, supporter of my writing to quite a comical mm. level, actually. So he, I used to write, when I first became a mum, I wrote quite a lot of stuff about breastfeeding or drinking alcohol as a mum or, you know, lots of mm. content that was probably quite parent-centric. And because I was working with Selfish Mother, a lot of that, you know, I wrote a lot of blogging um, articles about... Yes. Um, you know, mm. the pressure to, to feed your baby in a certain way or, you know, just the mm. kind of some of the comedy moments as well. And my dad read and listened to most of the things I did. So even when I started The Hotbed, which a lot of the content was really quite risque, you know, we talked openly yes. about masturbation. You know, we did live events where we talked about sex toys with groups of women. Um, mm. And we were very frank. And often I would be very frank about... Um, I try not to be too frank about my personal relationship in that regard but we we still came out Mm. and my dad would always um send me an email and he'd say you know I loved that podcast I really enjoyed it or he would have he would be one of the only people that had commented on a blog post you know and he would say like (laughs) you know I think this is a really informative piece of you know writing about breastfeeding and um Mm. That's would he sign off dad? Well, no, he, he always did it as, as he was a doctor, so he did Dr. Stephen Somerville. So he would always, yeah, he would always yeah. sign off with his. But it, 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 yeah. sometimes I found I, I remember starting a website quite early on, and, and I think he, when I looked at the sort of the comments, I'd, I'd be really excited. Where, oh, someone's commented, and then I would see it was my dad that had commented, <laughs> and I would be a little bit embarrassed because obviously he wouldn't do it under a pseudonym, so it was very clear that he was a relative, you know. <laughs> Um, but I guess what I'm saying is that ultimately I I thought, and that's a, that's ex- initially I started to try and write a book about him because he was a very interesting figure and 
he mm-hmm. we used to live in South Africa and he worked for the anti-apartheid movement and he had a really yeah. interesting life um, mm. and I started writing about that and then I kind of thought you know what it's too soon for me to write about this and yeah. so instead I yeah. started writing about aging instead um, mm. and with a, with a view actually to sort of just thinking about all the challenges I was facing so I've done it I did a podcast and I'll have a chapter about grief because the reality is is that as you get older you are unfortunately more likely to be confronted with losing people that's just yeah. what happens yeah. Um, yeah. and I felt that I had lost people when I was younger but I was so ill prepared um, for what grief was like and I was kind of I don't think anyone can prepare you for it to be honest Mm. but essentially what I've tried to do is I've always been thinking like what would you know dad would love it if I was writing this and he would Mm. he would he kind of even though he was a very very private person and didn't like sharing I think he kind of there was a, a an angle where he quite respected the fact that I was I was sharing my feelings and being very open um and so in a way and I think that's kind of it with 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 kind of losing someone is that if there's any silver lining at all, then sometimes I just have to sort of think, you know, dad would have loved this. You know, he would yeah. have really been, he would have laughed at this. He would have thought it was funny. Um, yeah. And that makes it, it doesn't make anything better, but it just, it makes things slightly easier. Yeah. And is writing the book, for, um, uh, is that therapeutic for you? Is it is it useful to sort of, um, I don't know, unpack things and just sort of hold them and look at them, consider them, you know, and, and sort of sit with, with those feelings and things. I, th- I really think it is. Um, mm. And I think I am, um, I mean, one of the things, for example, when I was, you know, I'm still grieving at the moment, but one of the things yeah. that I kind of learned, I think, to, I actually I interviewed Carrie Lloyd, who's got that amazing mm. podcast, yes. Griefcast. And one of the things she sort of said to me was that, you know, it, I'm very much a kind of can-do person and I love self-help books. So basically, I, I kind of, if I have a problem, I'm like, right, well, there must be an app for that. I'm going to get the app and, <laughs> you know, I'll do the meditation and that will sort that out. And when dad died, it was a similar thing. It was like, right, OK, there must be a process to this and I'm going to go through the process and then I'll come out the other side. And then actually what I learned <clears> was that there there isn't a set process so actually there's some days when you wake up and you're okay and there's other days Mm. where you really do feel very very low Um, and then there's other days when you're in shock and then there's other days where you feel quite euphoric and so and and unfortunately that doesn't end that continues until you die yourself and that revelation to me was quite significant because I thought this is not and I think ageing is quite similar, actually, is that I was like, what's the solution to ageing? And then I was like, there is advice and there's things that you can do. But ultimately, um, there isn't a solution. It happens. Mm. <laughs> you know, you yes. can't stop it. Yeah, absolutely. And what about, you know, a really common um, revelation for women in their 40s is the discovery of perimenopause. Um, and, you know, and for me personally and it would seem this is quite widespread amongst women they you know they they suffer with perimenopausal symptoms for over a year before you know they've actually come across the word or understand what it is are you really clued up about menopause and perimenopause do you consider yourself you're 47 aren't mm. you are you do you consider yourself perimenopausal at, at at the moment if you recognize any symptoms well i mean part and i you know i've I've written about this part of the problem i think for me is that because i had my my second daughter really quite late so mm. I, I was 46 when she was born and so my hormone my hormones generally feel very um in flux so i had a whole period of time after she was born where I was suffering from anxiety um, and I was then I think diagnosed with postnatal anxiety so you know that was kind of that wasn't perimenopausal I went and had a blood test done and my blood it didn't look as if I was perimenopausal so at this time as far as I know I thought that the the anger and the mood flux and all the other things that every woman I think experiences at different times um, mm. it's, it's probably more related to sleep deprivation. <laughs> yeah, I mean, because, the, because the, the, that's why I was sort of asking is because it has occurred to me that you've got... So obviously you've got two young children, one's 18 you know, months. still a baby. Yeah. yeah. Um, so tiredness is, com- comes with the territory. And, you know, some of those typical p- perimenopausal symptoms like anxiety, impatience, low mood may have sort of all morphed into a, an, an exhaustion due to having a young family plus you know you've you've 
had you know a bit of a crappy time recently mm. with stuff we've just talked about you know lockdown and your and your dad dying so i suppose tr- difficult to to sort of work out that you 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 said it sounds like you have those symptoms but but actually there are other things that could explain mm. them so how do you know i guess well and that i mean that's that's um i mean that in itself is interesting and that's I, I sort of feel like a lot of women are very ill prepared for. Actually, we're we're kind of ill prepared for everything. You know, we're we're not <laughs> particularly well prepared for the reality of what motherhood is like and the kind of loss of identity. And and I think we're also not quite prepared for what ageing. You know, what what the physical and the mental impact of that is. And and perimenopause and menopause they are being talked about more. Um, but sometimes there seems to be quite a lot of focus on physical symptoms, which are which are which are bad enough with without so much mm. the emotional side of what happens. Um, yeah. And I think, yeah, I mean, for me, one of the really positive things that I've found, I mean, I've, I've, I'm trying to get more into just questioning myself and how I feel, because I used to be incredibly angry. Um, almost every day I was angry and the anger came out of nowhere. I mean, I'm not an angry person. I'm generally quite calm, um, but I would find myself sort of, I mean, one of my favorite things, which I've stopped doing now is if I was angry with my partner, I would throw his belongings out of the window. Um, usually just a pair and something quite innocuous, like a pair of socks or, but yeah. often he would then come into the bedroom and he'd be like, you know, I can't find my socks anywhere or where's that book that I was reading and it's because I'd thrown it out the window it was very sort of (laughs) passive aggressive rather than addressing and it might be something quite minor that had set it off like coming downstairs Mm. and discovering that the kitchen was an absolute tip Um, Mm. that would be enough to spark it off and um, and actually now what I've I've tried to do I, I, I do a bit more kind of just take a step back breathe and mm. it, whether I do have to use a little app, like I use Clementine sometimes, which is a great app. Um, I'm not sponsored by them or anything, but they, they, <laughs> um, you know, they just offer these very short little meditations, or right. um, Calm app or whatever. Or I yeah. just literally go, do you know what? What is, you know, what is going on? Just calm down, because I realised I was inflicting a lot of anger on my family, and mm. I think it's also, I think women. Women often feel ashamed about getting angry, but I think sometimes you need to ask yourself, why am I feeling so angry today? You know, and, and mm. if it is sleep mm. deprivation, then, yeah, probably need to get yeah. an early night. Or for me, sometimes it's because I, you know, and I'm much more mindful about the way I drink now because I realised that on the when I was even mm. just having a couple of glasses of wine in the evening, the following day I would be definitely um, impatient and, and more angry. And I'm not being judgy about drinking because people are no. all very different in terms of what they can tolerate. But the older I've become, the worse, you know, the worse kind of hangovers and the more kind of fallout there is. And so I, I guess that's one of the positives of ageing is actually you start to recognise, OK, actually, this doesn't work, you know, this... Having yeah. two glasses of wine doesn't work, so I won't do that. Or, you know, screaming at the top of my voice and throwing my partner's stuff out the window. That doesn't work. Um, is there another... And you hopefully don't keep repeating the same patterns. Yeah, yeah, OK. Um, you know, I love that you post about sort of worries and considerations that just enter your head and then you quite often really delve into them. When you, you know, your posts on Instagram on the squares are quite long, you know, you write, mm. I mean, well, because you're a writer, I guess. So, um, and recently you posted um, about the fact that um, ageing means that you're closer to death and you said that you found that quite liberating. Mm. And why? In what way? You know, what have you felt liberated from? Or is it... So, yeah, mm. sorry. Oh. Well, it's just interesting. I'm reading... At the moment, I'm reading... Um, I think it's... I think I pronounced it right. Glennon Doyle. I think she's written a book yeah. called Untamed, which I think I came to quite late. Um, oh. But I was... A lot of her kind of um, writing is about the fact that women sort of live up to certain expectations and they they push down their own needs and their own wants and their own priorities and they often become martyrs and I mean motherhood is often like that you know you mm, yeah. you stand next mm. to any mum and basically <clears throat> you complain about how far down the ladder you are at any time you know <laughs> and I think one of the things that happened is that I I found that i it's, it's kind of sharpened up my focus quite a bit. And maybe that's been amplified by the fact that I've lost my dad. I mean, my dad yeah. didn't get to retirement age. He was 71. So he was going to retire mm. this year. 
And so he worked and worked and worked and worked and he enjoyed his work, but yeah. he never entered that kind of stage of the luxury retirement, which I don't know if that actually exists anymore. But, you know, the kind yeah. of, you know, taking up a hobby, you know, going for long walks, yeah. going on holiday. He didn't have any of that. Um, and I guess I just started thinking I can't project forward with any certainty anymore. And I think lockdown mm. has taught us that is that yeah. unfortunately we can't predict the future so we better try and start building the lives that we want now because unfortunately mm. you know it, we I'm not saying that we could die but you know the it could happen and actually that yeah the other thing that happened which sounds very morbid is that I actually realized that I I now had quite a few people that had died that I loved really really dearly and so I was like I'm not very scared of death anymore I'm I'm, I'm not scared mm -hmm. of it because there's people that I've loved who have gone through it and I've lost them and so when the time comes I'm I'll be ready for it do you know what I mean mm. and mm. obviously with young yeah. children I don't want that to be any time soon and I'm not making it sound as if I want to have a you know any kind of illness but I think there is a sense of, you know, again, with ageing, accepting, accepting that it's, that it's, it's going to happen. Yeah, yeah. And we don't yeah. think, we don't face up to it, do we, in our society at all? No, uh, no. But I do feel that this, you know, the the, the lockdown and, and, you know, coronavirus has made, has, uh, uh, funnily enough, I've had that sort of feeling of like, right, well, if I get it and I die, that, that that's so be yeah. it. <laughs> kind of, you know, a, a kind of, again, a, acceptance, because suddenly there was this thing that was, you know, a sort of dangerous and scary and, and you know, affected people in different ways. And, you know, I, I, yeah, I think I felt that I, I had just started to think about it a bit more and, and the fact that that might happen, you know. Um, so, and that acceptance, I think, is, is, is mm. quite a... Yeah, I can see that that would be liberating. Yeah. So and do, do you think that these realisations and insights that come with age and uh, th that we've talked about will be beneficial um, uh, as if, with parenting? Do you, do you think that they'll make you a different or even better parent than you would have been 15 years ago? Yeah, I mean, it's funny because I, I it's, a, it's a mixed bag, I think, being an older mm mother or being an older mother of young children and on some levels I think I don't have I don't know it's very difficult because I don't know what it would have been like if I'd been in my 20s um mm. I, th I, I think in some ways I'm I try and what I don't miss is that I don't want to go out and have a really hectic social life I don't yeah. have a, so I don't have that kind of like all oh, my kids are really getting on my nerves because I really want to go out and no. I want to go to the pub mm. you know and I don't have that so strongly what I do find frustrating I suppose sometimes with motherhood is that I now feel like I'm hitting my stride writing wise and creative wise mm. and trying to do that combined with small children who are still very dependent yeah. so it's kind of that's that's the the only frustration I have is that I want them to they're aware that I do podcasts and they know that I write um but uh, uh, and all writers I don't really know what the solution is but I mean for me for example the time when I get to write is when my youngest has her nap at lunchtime mm. but that means that my older one who's six usually would go on a an ipad or would watch tv yeah. for an hour and a half or whenever and mm -hmm. and there is guilt with that, you know. There's oh, always guilt. Um, but, yeah. but part of me, and I'm trying to. I'm watching a lot of Queer Eye at the moment. They've got a new series out, and oh. I, one of the things I love about them is, you know, I'm sort of also like, this is a good role model for her because, yeah. okay, she's watching crap on a screen for an hour, but actually she's seeing her mum trying to pursue her dreams. Yes, yes, yes. Because of course, I think there's nothing worse than a sort of I, I don't know. Well. I think I would I would hope that eventually she'll be able to think, oh, it was great that mum really tried to do the things that she wanted to do. Um, mm. And so I think, yeah, that's the only frustration I have. I think in terms of being, I mean, I don't know. I, I found I've, I've been quite an anxious mum the first time. Mm. Um, and I think that could have been because I'd struggled quite a bit to conceive. And so by the time, right. people don't really talk about that, but by the time you actually have a baby, you're quite fearful. Yeah, of things yeah. that could go wrong and you, you can be overly protective um, actually having a second child I've been the opposite I've been much much more laid back um, mm. to the you know to the point where I you know I go to the park and sometimes I see other mums looking at me like oh really you're, what, you're letting her climb up the slide on her own because <laughs> they're kind of hovering over them you know all the time yeah. 
and I'm sort of much more kind of like, oh, do you know what? You know, she's fine. And, you know, obviously I'm not I'm not letting her sort of drop from a dangerous no. height. But I'm sort of like, listen, if she stumbles over a couple of times, it means the next time she can actually get up and go mm. down the slide. Um, mm. Yeah. And um, I mean, there's a wonderful, actually, I was just reading it last night in Glennon Doyle's book, Untamed. There's an amazing chapter about parenting and just saying, you know, that unfortunately the pressure that we put on ourselves in terms of being really excellent parents and engaging with our kids 24 7 and it's not yeah. healthy and essentially what no. it produces is very needy dependent children um oh, yeah I, it's because what, what Paul and I had children when we were very young and um and I look back and just think I, I was a terrible mother because I, <laughs> I don't, I'm, not, I, I'm not I wasn't but uh, compared to now there is that massive pressure at the moment that you've got to be if, having really quality time with your children all the time yeah. and yeah which I don't think there was when you know like uh, 20, when we had ours 25 years ago I was 25 when I had my first mm. baby and you know then there wasn't that pressure and um, how are they now because that's the other question is that you know they're yeah, perfectly they well formed human beings yeah, aren't they yeah absolutely yeah um, yeah they I, think I, I sort um, of really grew up with that I, I was telling my daughter about it because in the summer holidays my mum was a, a single parent and she would send me to my grands for six weeks yes same and, here. Um, I used to be sent yeah. off to grandparents and for, and for six, <laughs> so imagine just saying goodbye to them for six weeks and I was probably about <laughs> six five or six and um, and my gran would, I remember that we had one pair of stilts in the garden. That was the main entertainment. And I would run into the house and I'd go, I'm bored, I'm bored. You know, what am I going to do? I'm so bored. And she'd go, you know, go, get on the stilts. And so I would, I would mm. walk with the stilts up the garden and down the garden and up the garden and down the garden. And I'd do that for days and days on end. Yeah. Because there wasn't, you know, and, and this is the only thing I worry about is that during those very boring periods of time, I would dream and I would use my imagination and I would yes, I would yes. invent this fantasy world where I was married to Simon Le Bon or, you know, whatever it was. And I probably wasn't six then, I was probably older. <laughs> um, but the reality is now is that there's kind of this, every moment of time has to be filled and yeah. we are the same. So we are like, I must listen to a podcast I must go on my phone I must go on Instagram oh, yeah. and our kids are I mean you know that's the main we've got seven weeks off now and my fear yeah. is is that the pressure is to fill up every moment with something and yeah. I'm like it's not healthy so I keep I keep no. now trying to say you know certainly to my older daughter like just go away and entertain yeah. yourself and yes. you know because yeah. I would have been left for hours and hours and yeah. I just I don't think it's healthy and I think many of us know in our hearts it's not healthy but we see mm. what other parents are doing and we think we're not good enough yeah well it's back to that comparison thing again isn't it so it's yeah 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 but I think surely you know with uh, you know with age comes I, I think you must be a better parent if if you're doing it a bit later than 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 earlier I, 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 yeah, not everybody but you know yeah I don't know I think that when you're younger you 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 may be more fun and you've probably got yeah. more physical resource yes yeah. and you've got more <laughs> more stamina and you know sometimes I do think god if I'd I mean it would have been a disaster because I was you know I had a very messy life when I was younger and but I, I sort of sometimes mm. I do wonder I think there's it's probably I think there's brilliant parents who are in their 20s and yeah. there's brilliant parents who are in their 40s I guess uh and each age brings something different. Yeah, there's no, there's, yeah, probably no perfect time, is there? No, because you could, I mean, I think there is that kind of pressure when you're younger that you want to be out there. And actually, probably the comparison is even worse, because when I look at friends who are younger, mm. they're even more consumed by the sort of, the, the sort of status thing, you know, the person who's got the better car, the bigger house, oh. the better job, the bigger salary, yeah. um, is mm. thinner, prettier, more uh you know funnier and mm. I certainly one of the things with getting older is I I really I care I, I'm I'm starting to care much less about the status angle yeah yeah um, yeah yeah but my, my last question is when is the book out when is the when is it well going to... I wish I could say because at the moment it's still at pitch it's still <laughs> we're still pitching it at the moment so um I'm hoping god I've got my fingers crossed that I will have some Good news, because as you said, mm. I, I feel like, like well, like many people over this last period, it's been quite a dark time. And so yeah. 
Um, there's no date yet, but I do have a, a fiction book coming out in February um, oh, have called you? The Baby, which is um, coming out on um, oh. HarperCollins. So that, I mean, that, that, yeah. that's kind of, it's going to be, it's a funny book about a woman who tries to get pregnant and rather than going through fertility treatment, she decides to have a series of one night stands. So oh. it's... oh. Oh, excellent. I want to read it already. And that, I must say, that, that isn't autobiographical <laughs> at all. Uh, no, OK. <laughs> but I know it'll be very funny. Um, so, you know, in the meantime, people need to check out your podcast, How to Be a Boss at Ageing. Um, it's a fabulous title that but basically explains exactly what it is. And it is full of um, Anarchy's insights and humour as she chats with really engaging and inform informative um, guests. So oh, I'll, I'll put a link to that. Yeah. Um, and thank you so much um for coming on the podcast um you know and if you don't follow anarchy on instagram you really are missing out so um i'm going to put her her details for that in the show notes as, as, as well so oh brilliant so i've really much. enjoyed it it's been great having a chat so that was Anarchy Somerville oh, and that was, she's lovely. Yeah, she it was a lovely. Really lovely, lovely chat. And, you know, um, all the details for um, everything about her will be um, in the show notes uh, on the on the podcast. Um, so we've decided we're going to do a little, um, you know, when we can, well, when we can be bothered, we've got anything to say, maybe. Um, <laughs> uh, a thing about stuff that has interested us this week yeah. or you know caught our attention um aren't you lucky basically what what we've got mm. here is that you think you've got to the end of the podcast and then we're just going to come back with yeah. a little chat of what's going on and also it is worth saying if you reach out to us if you've got any suggestions Please of what you want to hear us, or yes. you know even even maybe some we could turn it into an agony ant thing yeah, couldn't we, we could. you know, i mean really we don't know where we're going with this now we're just we've <laughs> but you run for the ride and buckle up go. yeah so um has anything sort of piqued your interest this week amy well it's funny because you know we were talking about uh, the kids going back to school and so yeah I've got this thing of sort of like oh I can get back to doing all that all that stuff that I was doing you know like when I was a full human before yeah. and I was like oh you know you go into a room and you think what have I come in here for mm. I can't really remember what it what, no. what that was that I was supposed to be doing <laughs> I actually watched five episodes of um, Grace and Frankie oh, yeah. on, on uh, Netflix yeah. which I know I'm very very late to the season uh, to, to the party on that they're on season 12 yeah, or something yeah. but I I, I, oh, I just lolled and just watched it on my laptop yeah. and then when the credits came up I just watched another one yeah. because I could oh absolutely god yeah. so that's so, what I'm loving at the um, moment I had a week to myself um, a week ago uh, you know, Home Alone and I watched all three seasons on Netflix of Selling Sunset, which have you seen that yet? Oh, well, I've heard about this. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you know, everybody's um, watching it and talking about it. So it's um, uh, it's set um, within the Oppenheim Group, which is uh, the most successful estate agency in LA. So you've got like that property porn element. So yeah. you get to see inside the houses um, that are worth that they're flogging in West Hollywood, um, which are all worth millions. Although by the end of season one. I was slightly turning my nose up at them. You know, they all look the same, quite frankly. Um, you know, although obviously totally out of this world luxury. But you know, so, you um, know if, if you're feeling a bit shit about like oh, about where, like, you a, live. where you live, what oh, you've got, yeah, yeah, yeah. like go and watch this. Go and watch it. And yeah. uh, are they all just sort of like soulless people? No. Well. They're, some of them are really, really great. Um, some of the characters, you know, the, the the best bits are the characters of, you know, the women that are, and, and the relationships between them. So there are like sort of seven women that work in the office. Yeah. Uh, so the these are the re group. what they call the realtors, what we'd call realtors. estate agents. Yeah, yeah, real, yeah, real, okay. yeah. Uh, real estate agents. Yeah, they're not estate agents, are they? Mm, you know. um, so, um, so it's about the characters of those women, the relationships between them. And on the whole, they are pretty awful to each other. Yeah. So because it's know, commission, isn't it? Is it cutthroat? Oh, god! So they're really motivated right. with. I mean, and that's actually something that's you know quite quite good about them is that they're really all those women. I mean, you know, they work really hard and they're very motivated. You know, you know about money and everything. Um, but they 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 can't stand each other. They're forced together. You know, a lot, which makes for fabulous you know histrionics. Um, <clears throat> and you know, you'll pretty quickly get the measure of them and be totally invested. Um, and I. I could sit here and dissect those characters for hours um and uh, actually i wouldn't dismiss that as a an idea for a podcast <laughs> special a selling sunset special that's how that's how much i enjoyed it um but you know many people i know will be a bit lofty about it and to those people i would say just get over yourself and surrender to it because i haven't met anybody yet that hasn't loved it and you don't even have to tell people that you're watching yeah it. you I mean, know you could can, be a 
but guilty for, secret. Absolutely. For God's sake, do not deny yourself. Um, three series on Netflix. Um, and as I say, I, I would encourage you to carve out the time to binge watch all three within a week. This sounds like a little escape hatch, actually, from, from the grim... I mean, we're about to go into autumn which I love this mm. season actually all the colours changing yeah. and everything yeah. but maybe that that is something that you just have there maybe get invested in season yeah. one now while, yeah. while the, the nights are still light you're going to be primed then yeah, yeah for... absolutely but I think you'd actually probably just best just watch all three series all at once because <laughs> because otherwise people are going to stop chatting about it it's, it's you know true. like catch up Amy come on so, yeah. <laughs> yeah I want to be involved in these really important yeah. conversations Louise <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's so, great to be back. Yes, it is great to be back. And um, yeah, we're back every every week now, hopefully. So yeah. yeah. Have bye. a good one. See you. Bye. Bye. Produced by Louise Daniels. Visit louise-daniels.com. Hiya, it's Rich Wilson, host of the excellent podcast Insane in the Membrane. I have a brand new podcast coming your way called Insane in the Fembrane, where I sit down with strong, confident, powerful women and find out what it takes to be a woman because uh, I don't really know to be honest I had I thought I did thought I had an idea but I don't so our first guest is star of Top Chef and soon to be on Netflix crazy delicious it's Carla Hall prime example I go out I'm like I'm gonna be a part of this yard thing <laughs> you know I'm gonna go out there okay he cuts the grass so I'm looking at those pine trees it's like nine of them I'm looking at those pine trees I'm like ah oh, they're taking over our yard so I'm gonna go in and cut the base of the trees off, right? And just so it can be really pretty. But before I got to that, I said, I think I'm gonna cut the tips off. I had a rope. I said, Matthew, let's just go off and cut the tip off of one of those trees. They're too tall. He's like, I don't think that's gonna work. I said, you haven't tried. <laughs> I go out with my rope. I didn't even get changed into a t-shirt. I have on a regular shirt, because I it's yeah, gonna right. be easy. <laughs> I throw that rope up. I'm trying to lasso it to pull it down so we can just snip, snip. And I videotaped it, just there was a video camera and I wasn't even thinking about the video running. I went back to look at it. Matthew was standing at the, this. Matthew was standing there looking at me like, this ain't gonna work, but I'm gonna let you do it, honey. I'm gonna let you do it. <laughs> <laughs> and I am laughing at the video. It just captured this exact thing that you're talking about. Yeah. You know, I went yeah, out yeah. to do, to step into his role. He's like looking at me like, that's not gonna work. That's not gonna work. You know, yeah, and yeah. I'm like, I had I had to see it for myself. It's like you're right, but if he had said, "Carl, it's not going to work," and just beat me down, I would have I would have 